So 2030 is a big year because that's the top of the box, 2030. That's where we're going on climate action, 2030. That's when we deliver on ending poverty in Canada and around the world by 2030. It's an exciting time to be alive because we actually can do all these things, but not with business as usual. Pharmacare, universal child care, free tuition, and a doubling of carbon emission cuts all by 2030. Those are some of the key platform pledges unveiled today by Green Party leader Elizabeth May. She says the country has everything it needs to tackle its problems except vision. May calls her plan to transition Canada's economy mission possible, and that includes net zero emissions by 2050. So is it possible? Andrew Leach is an associate professor at the University of Alberta. He joins us from Edmonton. David McLaughlin is a climate policy expert and former CEO of the National Roundtable on the Environment. Hello to both of you. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Thanks for making time. So I wanted to dig into a bit of the green uh, climate policy. Uh, Elizabeth May announced the rest of the Green Party's platform today, but said that it's essentially all through the lens of the actions that the, that the party wants to take on fighting climate change. Professor Leach, let me start with you because one of the central planks there is banning the import of of all foreign oil. How realistic is that and what would be necessary to facilitate that? Well, it's, it's probably more realistic today for a bit than it was uh, previously with what happened in Good Saudi. Point. But uh, but I think what you're looking at is with a lot of their policies, electricity, oil, et cetera, these regional dimensions that on a national level, we don't import much oil. We're a big net exporter of oil. But regionally to Eastern Canada, we import basically anything we east of Quebec City. So Quebec and, and the Maritime provinces import a lot of oil and they import from the US, but also from overseas. So if you get into a question of cutting their oil supply short, you've either got to be shipping, shutting down those refineries and shipping uh, refined product in, or you've got to be looking at a new pipeline to ship Canadian crude further east or more tankers in the St. Lawrence and more capacity to get crude to Montreal. And so none of those things I don't think are going to fit well in a, in a Green Party platform, for sure. So, uh, Mr. McLaughlin, David, as I've fed you on many times, uh, another thing, I was asking Elizabeth May in an interview about this, and mm -hmm. she, was, she was also making the point that she felt like all the refining capacity that was needed in Canada, based on that promise, already existed, that there, no further money had to be poured into uh, refining. What do you think of that? Well, um, I think this is all fine in theory. Uh, it's the practice uh, of it that makes it that much more uh, complicated because, as Andrew pointed out, we, uh, you know, Canada is not one market. It's a series of markets. And so the idea that you could just have, uh, you know, uh, one refinery dealing with one set of, uh, of, of, of oil imp uh, inputs versus another, you know, d doesn't really hold, uh, hold true. I mean, if you, have to, if you actually have to then build a pipeline to, to move, you know, product to, for refining, so uh, then, of course, that goes against what the Green Party actually uh, wants to do. So this is the kind of stuff where it sounds very fine at the, uh, in theory, but the practice of actually doing it and, uh, and trying to do it within some kind of market economy is just not realistic. Professor Leach, part of the policy or one major plank that you highlighted in the column that I believe you wrote for CBC as well that kind of jumped out at me was this idea of, of sort of uh, making, making sure all buildings were um, uh, were. were were retrofit or powered by renewable energy rather by 2030. How realistic is that? I think that that's one of the ones where you really run into how much the speed matters. That if you want to retrofit buildings, think of what a deep energy retrofit looks like in your house. You've got to be out of your house for some period, redo insulation, redo heating and air conditioning, et cetera, depending on where you are. And so if you're talking about doing every building, let alone every house in Canada, uh, in a space of about 10 years, just the logistics of that is, is impossible. Uh, now, Ms. May would counter that, well, this is what we do, but that doesn't change how challenging it is to move up the timelines from even something like the NDP's goal, which I think was half by 2030, if I recall correctly, forward to doing every building by 2030. Lo the logistics are implausible, if not impossible. What about the cost associated with that? And I know I'll, I'll say that uh, Ms. May has said that she has costed, she submitted all these, mm -hmm. her party submitted all of these proposals to the parliamentary budget officer, who we'll have on the show, and uh, actually today, mm -hmm. and uh, that cost will be revealed. It, it has not yet been. Uh, the proposal that they have to jack up corporate tax rates, mm -hmm. is that enough to pay for a lot of what they're talking about? We have no idea. I mean, because this, uh, th their plan is so comprehensive, so expansive, and therefore literally so expensive that you really can't tell it uh, at this point. So uh, it, the, the problem 
if you will, with the, with the Green Plan is that it is so consistent. By that I mean it is so consistently focused on climate actions. It is so consistently focused on trying to make Canada uh, match the UN Sustainable Development Goals that that is what's driving it. And the idea of, of any cost sort of factors within it to drive this to actually implement these uh, these uh, uh, promises is really appears kind of secondary. So it doesn't matter to me what the PBO officer is going to you know going to come up with. It's just going to be a lot of money. Just to follow up on that, you know, and and as as Professor Leach was alluding to, Elizabeth May would counter and say this isn't about the cost. We're we're in an emergency yeah. situation here. This is a yeah. war on the effects of climate change, yeah. right? Absolutely. That is the uh, that is her consistent line uh, throughout that, and and you can see how that animates it. And so I give them a high points for being consistent within uh, the, uh, having that as an animating feature and theme of their platform, but it is, uh, it's really a triumph of idealism over any kind of reality at this point in terms of either the costing or the actual ability to implement this within these kinds of time frames that they say are so urgent. Uh, the, the mechanics, the infrastructure uh, is just not in place. How expensive, Professor Leach, do you anticipate the majority of this will be? Like, uh, just taking a sort of bird's eye view. Well, I don't think we have enough numbers to even put a dollar on, to be honest. I'll be really curious to see what the PBO does. Although, to you know, to, to David's point, I think the number that I might look for more in the PBO costing is actually going to be their minimum income. That's probably a bigger dollar promise than almost anything in, the, in their climate change plan. So when you l overlay that basic minimum income, the maintenance of social programs that they're going to want, they're not going to want to go down a road of cutting some social programs to create a minimum income. And then you layer on top of it some of the, the big expenditures that, you know, I don't know how they're going to cost them. We'll see what comes from the PBO. Uh, but, you know, you're talking about, I think, conservatively, you have to be talking about a doubling of the size of the federal government. And they don't have the tax policy measures in here that I can see uh, to do that. But others, Kevin Milligan, uh, Jen Robson, I think, and and other economists have looked at the, the minimum income question. And, and I think that's going to be the big one in this platform, not the climate. And just to follow up with one last question uh, before I let you both go, I, the, the thing that we hear often from both the NDP and the Greens is ending uh, is, is just in general, talking about ending fossil fuel subsidies. And I, I would say it's one of the things I get the most emails about. A lot of people confused about exactly what that means and what the implications specifically on resource-based economies and provincial economies in this country would be. Uh, Professor Leach, your, your understanding of what they mean by that and the potential impact from your perspective. Yeah, a lot of this anchors back to a 2015 study that IISD did on what they called fossil fuel subsidies in Canada. Interestingly, more than two thirds of those are provincial policies that a federal government couldn't touch. So really what's left on the federal side are some uh, special treatment for flow through shares. Lindsay Ted's at Calgary has done some really good work on those. Uh, some special treatment for oil and gas development expenses and, and exploration expenses. And then, of course, the, the one time big expense of the Trans Mountain Pipeline. But that's not some, none of those are things if you're cutting out oil and gas anyway, it's you know, you're, you're not you're not going to leave the value of those tax treatments in place in the sense that oil and gas companies aren't going to be drilling new wells are not going to be incurring new expenses, et cetera. So the value of those tax treatments also goes away. And so you can't say, OK, and we as a bonus, we get the fact that we're not collecting. Uh, we're not allowing these expenses to go on anymore. So I think the idea that whether it's the green plan or the NDP plan, that there's this magical billions of dollars a year that you can access while also cutting activity in the oil and gas sector is, and not impinging on provincial jurisdiction is a pipe dream. Final word to you, David. I would say as well that there's just not enough money in the oil and gas subsidies to make up any kind of difference here. Uh, it's, uh, I mean, it is part of, of overall climate policy. Let's not subsidize fossil fuel uh, uh, production and, and that yeah, because she wants it, it done. In the she first wants year it of done. Well, office. really, it's not just a balance sheet approach of, of money in, money out. It's also how do you grow the economy? You have to. The way to do this is we have to address climate change, get our emissions down while still growing the economy. And so what we see here is an attempt uh, to actually well. we'll just get rid of all these things that produce value, in the case oil and gas sector, that does have a contribution to the economy. And so there's no real sense of how that is going to play out. I mean, if you're shutting down economic growth while you're actually trying what to do this, what it means for the economy at a larger scale. So there's big, big issues there, big questions there beyond just a balance sheet approach, which I don't believe the PBO can reconcile in any particular way. We shall see. Hopefully that costing will be out soon. Thank you very much to both of you for making time for us today. Okay. I really appreciate it. Thanks to Andrew Leach and David McLaughlin. Lachlan.
Hi, I'm Vashi Capellos, host of Power in Politics. See more of our show by subscribing to the CBC News Channel or click the link for another video. Thanks for watching.